This is such a complicated, nuanced story. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to know about it. You know, I think that's it. This exhibit really discusses and explores the history of indigenous captivity that we know took place in the San Luis Valley and in southern Colorado. The way that we have uncovered a lot of this history is through listening to people who have been impacted by this. In some families, this maybe wasn't talked about. We've been finding these stories and, and like making those connections and helping them to understand the past so that they can come to terms with it or to actually be validated by these stories that they were true. N -A -V -A. This is an attempt to use art to give people an opportunity to have a conversation that the powers that be don't want to be had. They just want to talk about the happy outcome. And, and that wasn't true for everybody who was in this region. There were no happy outcomes for the people who were displaced and the people who lost their culture and their traditions and their livelihoods. People need to know this, and this history. <laughs> For the past 68 years, the space has been an exhibition dedicated to the colonialist settler uh, story, narrative, basically being a celebration of everything Kit Carson. And after 68 years, they decided to center a different narrative. We have changed direction. We originally had a Kit Carson exhibit throughout this space and representation of his life and what it would have been like here. We are now shifting the focus from Kit Carson to the people who actually lived here and um, had their lives affected. We know that where we were at was home to different indigenous communities. Of course, the Ute, the Apache. The fort sits in the shadow of Mount Blanca or Cisnagini, which is one of the four sacred mountains of the Navajo. We know that this space that we're in is the northern edge of the Spanish frontier. It was later Mexico. And then after the Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo becomes the United States. And indigenous people were part of the trade. They were considered commodities and they were sold, bought and sold. Raids were made upon the indigenous people and they were sold to wealthy people who could afford to have domestic help and also labor. And so they were taken from their tribes and, and you know, basically assimilated into Spanish life or whether it was um, a different tribe's um, life and just basically robbed of any of their indigenous cultures that they carried with them. I have a personal connection to that history. I have an ancestor who was an indigenous captive. My great-great-grandmother, her whole family was killed except for her and her young daughter. And so she really didn't have anything to go back to once they did sell her off. Um, however, she knew she didn't want to be there and she ran away several times and they kept bringing her back. So at some point she had to accept her fate and that she wasn't going to be able to, to leave or escape and go back to where she came from. I feel like there's a lot of stories similar to that and so we started this work to find those stories. They were in, in any of the history books. And Kit Carson was part of that story because he did have his own indigenous son as well, assimilated into his own family. Juan Carson was enslaved by Kit Carson. About 1870, Juan sat for a portrait. It just became even more poignant because it was like, yeah, he's representing his home. He belongs in this house in a big, powerful way, having lived here. This exhibition of native enslavement um, is an opportunity to have a conversation about a difficult topic um, that happened historically. You know, it seems, unfortunately, that any time a narrative is presented that challenges the dominant stereotype, is labeled as being irrelevant. On the right is Gabriel Woodson. He was 12 when that photo was taken, and within a few years had become a hardcore alcoholic who by his late teens, I think, had been shot and murdered in, in a bar fight. 
I um, had been thinking most of the week that he was kind of the trickster, you know, that if, like if my phone was suddenly doing something weird, it was Gabriel who was, you know, playing games. I was approached to participate in this project, I think about 2018. I've been living on the Navajo Nation for the past 34 years, and I, I've heard stories during the time I've been there about distant relatives of people having been captured and taken away from their family. I went to med school for four years. The government paid for my education, so I had a four-year obligation to work in a health shortage area. Went to the Navajo Nation in 87, chose to stay 34 years later. Shortly after I got to the reservation, I started going out, spending time with people, and photo documenting to the extent they would allow. I was shooting film. I've also always loved street art, and in 2009, I was in Brazil for three months and met some street artists who showed me work done by the French artist J.R., where he had faces um, and eyes of women from a favela looking down onto the wealthy beaches of Rio. But it was mind-blowing because it was the first time I saw someone blow a photograph up to scale and use it as street art. I came back to the reservation and just went about the business of trying to figure out how he did that. <laughs> and that's what got me here. Um, it's, you know, using this photographic medium presented in a street art way um, to tell an interesting narrative. You know, it's fascinating coming from a history of enslaved people and um, realizing that both predating African slavery and post-dating African slavery here in the Caribbean, in South America, Europe, the Philippines, you know, was the movement of native people. And it's just, yeah, it's a lot. I was just aware of the weightiness of what I am attempting to express and what I'm dealing with historically and wanted to do it in such a way that honored the people who were here. After the Emancipation Proclamation, when slavery has ended, <laughs> right, quote unquote, um, and there is rumor or word uh, in Washington, D.C. that there's this practice in the West of indigenous peoples being held captive. Uh, directions were given to Indian agents uh, in the West to really try to understand how widespread this practice was. This is a list of Indian captives who have been purchased for the services of the citizens of Conejos County or the citizens of Costilla County. This document is a census that was taken in 1865 by Lafayette Head, who's the Indian agent in Conejos County. He was responsible in some ways as an ambassador to the Utes, but as an ambassador, he was also complicit in maybe keeping the Utes sort of in a really fragile state, near starvation, in a welfare state, really. We know now that he had captives in his home, uh, but those don't appear on the census. Not only does he not list his own captives on the list, but in the letter that he writes to Governor Evans, he calls this practice barbarous and inhumane and indicates that um, this is a practice that has been practiced by Mexicans for generations. Um, and so he's really outraged, right, uh, in this letter to the governor and yet isn't completely transparent. We know just from that example that this list is incomplete. But one time the military had um, thought that Ted made most of his money based on the sale of indigenous slaves. So that may be one motivation. By 1870, he was the richest man in Conejos County. There's a, a note in the archives that uh, is just a half page long, and all it says on it is that he's accused of selling Navajo children. And it was determined that Head had withheld government provisions from the Indians, had speculated in government property, and that his interpreter was not proficient at speaking Ute. In this captive's research, and due to genetics today, um, we know that he had uh, had several illegitimate children by Indian, indigenous persons and, and Hispano. And he was the longest running 
Indian agent in Colorado. I think he held that position for eight years. Both of these, or all three of these reports are at National Archives. This report the first thing that struck me was just how beautifully written it was, you know. I mean, here's this incredibly poignant document legitimizing brutality in a sense, but it's so beautifully rendered. And then I learned that Lafayette Head, who wrote it, originally from Missouri, friends with Kit Carson, um, his mom was a one-room school teacher and she emphasized in him penmanship. I knew I wanted to do something with the poignancy of those handwritten lists of enslaved people. Under the column that is labeled name of Indian. These are Spanish names, right? Or in some cases, maybe, maybe an Anglo name. Um, certainly not the, the, the person's given name. And so immediately, it, you know, we can think about you know, identity being stripped away, right? And that disconnection from you know, where someone is from. There's another column that asks the question, is the person willing to return to the tribe? If you look at the responses, the majority are no, but I think if, if we think about the context of um, the way that this interview was probably done in 1865, it was probably done in English, um, maybe Spanish, if there was a translator, so there's certainly some you know, language issues, but the interview was probably done with the person that is listed as the owner, right, or with the family that the captive resides with. And so certainly there's not any motivation for, for the head of the household to, to say that, you know, that someone is willing to go back to their tribe. There's one individual on this page that we're looking at that does say yes, but it was pointed out to me that the person that says yes is the second oldest person on this list. They're 35 years old. They were acquired the same year that the census was taken. So presumably, we don't know this for sure, but presumably it could be an old, it's an older male who maybe finds himself in a new situation, who knows, you know, and is much deeply, much more deeply connected to to his tribe, and he's saying, you know, of course I would want to return to my tribe. I think it's cool to think as well that whoever said, yes, I want to go back, said it regardless of who was in the room. <laughs> I think it's interesting how timely this exhibition is. I feel like the National Discourse has made this even more important and more relevant. I feel like the, the stories of people of color have always been left out of the narrative, and I feel like people are starting to focus on these pieces. And people are relying on DNA a lot these days, and they're finding out that they actually do have, you know, Native American, indigenous, um, you know, blood in them, and thinking they've grown up, thinking they were one, person and now finding out they're another and then seeking out that history. So I think that that's changed and helped us a lot as a nation try to rediscover ourselves and make that equitable across all historical narratives. These aren't well-known stories of indigenous slavery and that this is kind of the epicenter of where that happened and those, those aren't well-known at all. Um, I could go across the street and talk to someone who grew up here all his life, probably for several generations. They, probably, they might not know anything about it. And so to speak that truth, I think is an important step in healing. I was having a conversation with another descendant out there earlier and we were talking about what that does to everything you thought, you know, your life was like or who your family was. And, and it's like finding out that there was a piece that was lost that you could have had, like a piece of your history, like a piece of your culture that got lost because of this incident. But then at the same time, you have to recognize that you may not be here if that hadn't been what they went through. I feel like I have found a, um, a place of where I, I come from now, instead of always feeling like growing up K through 12, never having that history. Um, and not knowing where you belong in this landscape and what your story is. So I feel like that has brought that to fruition for me. This exhibit has been instrumental. This work has been instrumental in bringing people to this same point and getting them to understand what their history was. And they were part of this history. We're hoping through this exhibit will raise awareness of the topic, but also um, uh, invite in community conversation and dialogue around not just the history, but how that might still resonate and impact the people that live here today. We still have slavery going on. I mean, women are, and girls, 
are taken into slavery and they're used for trafficking. Do we have a record of how many, how many, how many have died, have committed suicide due to their traumas? And sadly, you know, there's so many parallels between what was happening then and what's happening now. One of the things that I'm aware of on the Navajo Nation is awareness people have about MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. This story, I think, is one of those borderland stories. When you talk about communities converging and the outcomes, sometimes there's you know, innovation and you know, collaboration, really amazing things that come through those interactions. Sometimes there's real tragic things that come out, and this is one of those tragic stories. No bit of information is too small or too insignificant in this story. We've got several examples of people who've come forward because of a rumor that they had heard from an aunt or a grandmother that when they reached out to us, we've been able to connect them to scholars or look at some of our research and share that back and make some of those connections and draw some of those, those lines together. It's really difficult to define and just to say this is who we are. Rather, I think it's more important to recognize all of the pieces and parts that have made us who we are at this moment.